Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Arthur Christie, Sarah Duarte, the author of The Transmigrant. If you've ever wondered what happened to Jesus Christ during those missing years, she might have unraveled that. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I was so excited to read your book. I have to tell you, it was such an incredible journey. How did you get the concept to write something like this? Because it chronicles that area of Jesus's life after the age of 12 to when he f first starts preaching, you know, in Palestine, Israel, that area. And it was so on point the way that you captured everywhere that he could have gone. So how did you come up with this? Well, I always had this idea that I wanted to kind of explore how all religions are um, connected. So I, um, this was just an idea that I had in my head for many years and I'm not particularly Christian or not Christian at all but I grew up in a Protestant country, so the culture, of course, is, um, is Christian. So once, I traveled a lot, so once I was in Kolkata in India, and I saw this bookseller on the street, selling books on the street, and one of the books said, Jesus in India. So I picked it up and thought, like, what is this about? And just left it for a few years. And then somehow it appeared on my Kindle. I'm sure at somewhere along the way I bought it and I started reading it. And it's about this um, Russian explorer that in the 1880s traveled in India, ended up in a monastery, Tibetan monastery in Northern India. And uh, he broke his leg and then, you know, he stayed there for a while in this monastery. And then one day one of the monks said, Oh, do you know that your Jesus was here? Okay, so that the story about the Russian explorer is a true story. Like the, the Russian explorer actually wrote this book. Um, and the, the scrolls that the Tibetan monks showed him were about Jesus traveling in India. And then later when this Russian explorer came back to Europe, he showed this to his friends in the church and everyone said, oh, no, don't talk about this. This, you know, like if you if you want fame, if you want money, then, uh, you know, we'll give it to you. But, you know, you should forget about this. Um, in those years, in the 1880s and 1890s, then Europe was kind of like French influence. So everyone spoke French. Also in Russia, like the, the educated people spoke French. So this all happened with the cardinals in France and France and Rome, I guess. Um, so anyways, this, this man, Nicholas Notovich, he thought that, no, I can't just bury this because this is true. And I saw this and they told this story. So he published a book and it's called Secret Life of, The Secret Life of Jesus Christ. So I started reading this book and it all started to make sense. So this is about Jesus traveling in India, in Nepal, in like throughout Asia, and how he studies with uh, studies Buddhism and Hinduism, and how that kind of like makes it in, makes the foundation of his faith, right? His Christian, what became sorry, what became Christianity. So um, I thought this was like fascinating because it kind of made all the puzzle pieces come together and I um, started researching it and read and read and read and read through the um, New Testament early on and th thought like, okay, here's 
this, like part of the story seems like of God, right? Like very like spiritual, like love each other, treat, treat each other well. And other parts were, oh no, I'm Jesus Christ. And I'm, you know, you, if you have to believe in me to come to heaven. So there was kind of like a disconnect there. And uh, yeah, so anyways, <laughs> so that's why I started writing about Jesus' uh, lost years, and it's fascinating. And to me, I like now I believe it was true. And of course, what I wrote is fiction, so it's the story of this arrogant little Jesus. Okay, let me take this back. Not arrogant, arrogant, but a young boy who thinks that he is closer to God than everyone else, and he thinks he's a little bit smarter. And... Um, he uh, meets, but since he's not from a spiritual family or a family of priests, um, then he can't, um, he, uh, sorry, am I talking too much? Oh, no, <laughs> not at all. So first, all right, so, right, because during that time, you couldn't be a priest unless you were born to a family of priests. So you brought in all those aspects of it and the history that was going on at the time was really right on point. Then um, for the whole, you could see different elements of the Judaism, the Christianity, the Muslims, the really all woven into the story. But how some of the stories that were portrayed would have come up the way that they did. I thought it was a really good analogy and the way that you pulled them through learning about all of these religions and then asking more questions and being able to say, just like I imagine you doing the research, to say, you know, I just don't think that fits. That's not right. Something had to happen here. Yeah. But I and love I, the way it explored asking questions and moving through. Oh, which country are you from? Sorry. Oh, um, I'm Estonian, but I grew up in Sweden. So okay. I've lived in like England, worked with Irish people. I've lived in Peru and I've lived in Spain. So I people tell me now that the Swedish accent is coming out more, but it, it's mixed. Like some days it's more Irish and uh, sometimes it's more British. If I go to England, I pick up my English accent again. So uh, it's, it is what it is now. No, it's a great accent. But just as a basis of what country you grew up in, that um, the religion was Protestant, right? Both, um, both Estonia and Sweden are uh, Protestant. So Estonia, when I grew up, was occupied by the Soviet Union. So it wasn't like even though I went to Estonian school and Estonian Girl Scouts or, or Scouts, boys and girls together, um, then like my culture was Estonian, but it was also Swedish. But in a way, they're similar because they're not, neither of them is particularly uh, religious, but then at the same time, they um, we went to church, like for Christmas, for Easter, uh, things like that. So there was this presence of Christianity, but it wasn't really um, very profound, I guess. No, but the way that you wrote it, the way that you researched it, it showed, you know, like, Yes, we're all arrogant at some times in our lives, but it showed yes. a young man coming into his own, learning from others, learning from other religions and cultures, and combining it all together to preach about love. Yeah. You know, that was the final milestone and the way that you brought us through the maze and how we reached it and... You know, just the fact that nature was involved, these we walked everywhere. So that was just an amazing trek that you took us on. What countries did you use to base all of the travels that take place on? 
But it was funny because, I mean, when you talk about the walking, um, I had walked the Camino de Santiago. So that's 500 miles more or less. And I knew exactly how much you can walk in one day. So when I picked up this, uh, the, um, Nicholas Notovich's book and said like, oh, he walked from here in one, from here in one year till there. I knew, like I looked at Google Maps and I was like, okay, this makes sense. So yes, like the Camino de Santiago in Spain, I had been to Syria, I had been to Palmyra, for example. So when you travel through there, I had seen it. Afterwards, I went to, uh, I went to Israel. I went to the Lake um, Sea of Galilee. I always forget because I call it Lake Kinneret in, uh, in the book. So I had been, like I was trying to kind of trace the places where I could go because parts of the book is like Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. And uh, even though I'm fearless, I'm not that fearless, um, at least Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. Um, but then I went to India. I went to uh, Puri, which is Jagannath in the book. I went to Nepal, where he's, he in the book stayed for six years in um, Kapilavatu, which is near Lumbini, where Buddha was born. So I tried to uh, go to these places, but a lot of the um, experiences uh, that he has in the book are, are things that I, ex or some of them, are things that I experienced in real life on my travels and meeting with Buddhists and Hindus and, and, and other people. Muslims and um, whatever. Wow. And what about the scrolls, Christy? Did you get to look at any of those? Or, you know, what was it like going along the way and finding out that these countries knew about Jesus? In the well, fact that he had actually visited there. Not in the fact of, you know, the Catholic or Christian faith kind of advertising him throughout the world, but just in the fact that he'd actually traveled there. Why do you think it's you, suppressed? Sorry, pack question. <laughs> uh, first of all, what people don't really realize, I think, and people keep asking me like, well, is it based on facts? And what people don't realize is we don't know anything about Jesus. Like, we can't prove anything. We can't prove anything is a fact. I mean, this was 2,000 years ago. So the, the books in the Bible were, were um, written like 30 to, seven, uh, 30 to 100 years after he died, probably by people who never met him. So we don't know how much of that is actually happened or what was added or what pulled in from other religions. Um, so the scrolls, you were asking about the scrolls. I've used uh, Nag Hammadi scrolls a lot in my writing, which are the Gnostics, uh, Gnostic, um, I always say Gnostic, uh, Gnostic uh, scrolls that were found in Egypt in 1945. So those for me may be more authentic because they were less uh, changed. But the scrolls that were, that Nicholas Notovich found in in um, Kashmir, in India, they, we don't know if they exist or not because he took photos of them and the film was destroyed. There are, like after he came back, they say that um, the, 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 the church sent people to the monastery and the monks said like, no, we've never heard of him. But then of course, it could have been just that they were like, they don't want people you know, to just start like, you know, making pilgrimages there and, and maybe they didn't like the person who was asking or whatever. Five people after that have been there and seen the scroll apparently. And now they say that there are, they, they have been brought to Lhasa and they're locked in, um, in some cabinets that you cannot open until Tibet is free again and the Dalai Lama returns. You know, so we don't know. We, uh, why would it be suppressed? Because it didn't go with what the church decided that Christianity was supposed to be or what, what Jesus 
was supposed to be because if he's like, oh, the son of God, the only son of God, um, you know, then it doesn't make sense. They don't want it to be mixed in with like uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. But then at the same time, it, I think that you can love Jesus just as much, whether or not he was a human being, if his, if his message came from God. Like why, I don't know, why do we have to separate the two? Like why does it have to be either or? Why can't he have been human and a wonderful prophet like the Buddha was? Like why would it make a difference? Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's my opinion. No, and just the way that you wrote the story and the the questions that I think we all have, you know, and we would all love to have the opportunity to to go to all of the places that were depicted in the book, to, you know, look at documents, to ask more questions, to understand other faiths and how they all played into the message that Jesus Christ ended up giving, you know, that I'm hoping carried down in the most authentic way, even though there are no firsthand accounts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I like one thing that I did when I was writing was like, I compared like the, there, there are several, several books on that, like the, the sayings between Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, and I think Islam too, to some some uh, degree and the messages are the same across. So like the fact that we split it into different religions shouldn't, I mean, fine, like believe what you want, but like accept that we are more similar than different. Exactly. In, With just different customs. Yeah. And, and then I think it's like, I started thinking about religions as traditions instead of religions and that made me made it easier for me to accept some of the rules that maybe I didn't agree with and say like okay this is the tradition but it doesn't make the person who believes in this religion worse or better than you or me so um, I felt very strongly like writing the book that I want that's what I wanted to show that we're more similar than different and uh, and yeah, like accept each other and see that, you know, like, as you said, like we're all arrogant at some point in our lives. And usually when we're young, you know, we think that, oh, we know everything. And it's, it's a natural thing, but it's like when you get humbled, when something happens to you or like some either something bad happens to you or you see something bad happen to another person that you start like it starts sinking in that we're um you know we're we're not better than other people and there's there's right. um a value in in finding that you know finding the understanding for each other no <laughs> definitely no you really did um, and I think it gives people hope because it's the hardships along the way that you have to overcome. You know, life is going to be a journey and different things are going to happen to along the way. There's, you know, there's going to be people that you meet that you wish you could stay with forever, but you can't. The circumstances don't fit and it's okay, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't I love the way it played <laughs> out. It was so reasonably construed. Um, it didn't tell us how to think, but it gave us a more likely than not pattern that he probably followed to get to know yeah. them. Yeah. It's interesting though. Like I found it interesting when I first published, I thought like, oh my God, Christians are going to hate it. But I'm so surprised at how many people have read the book and then posted like, you know, uh, either like emailed me directly or posted reviews and said like, I had moved away from the church, but this made me fall in love with Jesus again. And uh, I, I love that. Like I, at one point I thought like, oh my God, I've taken on too much, you know, like how can I, like little me, you know, write about this? But it's... Uh, 
it, I think I think I did an okay job. <laughs> no, you did a fantastic job. I mean, and you can tell by the reviews that people really understand how Jesus is humanized the emotional journey. It was just great. I wish I could explain it better, but it starts in the <laughs> year AD 8 in the backwaters of Galilee. And then you're hooked. I couldn't put it down. It's great. That's awesome. So what are you working yeah. on next? So I'm uh, about to publish my follow-up novel. It's called The Holy Conspiracy. It's after Jesus died and it's his brother, uh, Yaakov, James, let's, let me use the English names. It's easier to, mm -hmm. to explain it. So James, his brother then was elected as the leader of the disciples. And, um, and then, you know, they moved to Jerusalem and, you know, continued preaches, preaching what Jesus had been preaching. And then one day this man appears and says, hey, you know, I've met Jesus. He's risen and he's like, he talks to me and I'm the only one he talks to. And that's the Apostle Paul who actually created what we today call Christianity because all of the most authentic parts of the New Testament were written by Paul. So when I researched The Transmigrant, my first book, um, and I read through the New Testament, I was like, why, ha why don't people talk about it? It's right there in the Bible that the Jesus' disciples and Apostle Paul, they didn't get along and they were fighting each other. And of course, I'm not the only one who has noticed. So like, biblical scholars have written about it, but the Holy Conspiracy is the, actually the first novel that's written on the subject. And again, I'm trying to kind of show in a um, fictional way uh, how, what happened, like, like what, why Jesus' message was different than what's in Christianity today. So it's a little bit of a different story, and it has James in it, Mary Magdalene, um, and all the disciples, but it kind of shows what happened. Strangely, there's not too much written about the disciples. I know. I saw that. And I, it made me actually research different parts because Paul's message was more of like brimstone and fire, you know, and, yeah. and how. And Jesus was like, you know, it's really easy. Just be nice to people, love yeah. your neighbors. <laughs> And it was just that whole parallel. So you could see how they would be conflicted. But you are right. Nobody writes about that. And it is right there in the Bible. And the Bible just a, seems like the more you dig and the more you find from that time period, it seems like a collection of really good moralistic stories that were passed down and just combined into this amazing book. Yeah. And, and there, are, there are pieces of the Bible that are so wonderful and so nice. So like, I know that like, it looks like I'm writing against the Bible. I'm not really writing against it. I'm just trying to separate the, the pure, like the, the, the parts that are of love from what's been added that's more divisive, that makes, gives people kind of like the, the feeling that they have to write to tell somebody else, no, you're not good enough or you're not good enough. Because in the basis of it, it's like there, there's a message of love there, like love one another, like treat, treat others like you want to be treated. And uh, we are all sons of God. And that's actually also in the Bible, if you look. It does. We're all sons of God. Or daughters. Exactly. <laughs> And I love the way that all came across. So I can't wait to see your next book. When is it being released? So it's going to be released on June 3rd, 2020. So a couple of more months. June 3rd. Excellent. Are you going to do some book signings? Yeah, I'm going, I'm working on the marketing plan right now and trying to like get everything together. So uh, I've, 
sent it out to a lot of like reviewers and going to do like podcast interviews and uh, yeah, like book signings. I hope it's, it's harder than you think to get book signings. I live in New York city. I mean, there's a million other authors here, but uh, I have some good contacts by now. So yeah, I hope so. Uh, that's fantastic. I can't wait to see it. Is there anything we missed that you wanted to get out? Uh, no, only thing like be kind to each other. You know, that's, I think that's like really, really important. Like I love, I'm not always kind. I try to be, I admire people who are. And I think that if you can travel like go to places that are completely different, like get out of your comfort zone because that's where you go in to grow the most and see that, you know, somebody might look completely different than you or believe something completely different than you do. And there's, they're all nice. Like when you travel around the world, 95, 98% of everyone is nice. Like they're, we're all the same. Like that's all. <laughs> I know. I find that too when I travel. And it, I just was, I was sincerely impressed with how well you did with this. It's such a s tough subject to handle too, because it could have worked against you. But I think out of all of the reviews that I saw and reading it myself, I think it all worked for you. You made a really good good explanation of how he made it through those years, years that we don't hear about. And you have to wonder, he didn't suddenly appear. Yeah. But thank yeah. you for sharing so much about your work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for reading it. And I hope you you do get to, on, to your Algeria trip one day, <laughs> which is how we met. <laughs> I hope it's sooner than later. Yeah. But I hopefully hope so the virus is something that they can contain. Yeah, I hope so. Let's think positive, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right. Until next time, keep asking questions. The answers are out there. And dig a little deeper. This is a great book to get you started if you're interested in the life and times of Jesus Christ. We'll see you soon.